to this cabotage thing, which is quite different from from uh, congestion pricing. But this is uh, <coughs> this is uh, this is about basically road transport. Uh, the definition is transport of passengers or cargo, passengers as well could be an issue, particularly connected to tourists using buses and air transport. But we focus on cargo between a domestic origin and a domestic destination within a country, but it's done by a foreign operator. So if a trucking company from uh, Lithuania, low cost country, takes cargo from uh, Finland to Sweden, from Sweden to Norway, and then from Oslo to Molde or Oslo to Trondheim, then the last part of this is cabotage. Because then they take cargo from Oslo, which is loaded there, and unloaded in Trondheim or Molde or whatever within the country. And they can do that <coughs> for seven days. They can commute between Oslo and uh, Trondheim, taking cargo. But they cannot do it more than three times. So Oslo, Trondheim, Trondheim, Bergen, Bergen, Oslo. Then they have to go out again to, to, li to leave the country, or they can stay, but not, not doing any kind of transportation. There are lots of issues connected to this, <coughs> of course. One is competition. The Norwegian trucking companies are less happy with this, of course, because they, are, uh, they have to pay much higher wages. Uh, and uh, other costs components uh, are higher as well. So, uh, so um, there is an issue of, uh, of, uh, of costs, competition. And that uh, freight companies operating under very much more favorable conditions, as seen from the customer's point of view, are allowed to do this. And it's also easy to to circumvent some of these regulations. Um, are there any regulations to how often they're allowed to do this? Is there like a quarantine period? No, th th that's no, it's not, and that's 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 one of the issues because they can uh, they can leave for a very short period and then come back again, and. Uh, for for uh, this country, which is in a way, it's not isolated from the low cost countries, but it because you can come here by by ferry and using transit countries, it's not as close as, for instance, Denmark or Germany, where ha Germany has a uh, common border with uh, with with Poland, which is still at least a lower cost country even if wages has gone up there as well so so there is a there is a problem with this uh, this regime but the idea is from the authorities is to allow this to a limited extent to to force the domestic trucking companies into some kind of competition and to lower the transport costs the problem is uh, is connected to the different uh, different framework conditions for operations, where the wage level for a for a truck driver from from Lithuania is uh, I think it's one fifth or something what what you have in in Norway. So it's it's a big issue, uh, <coughs> and you have it as I said also within the tourist bus industry where uh, where. Uh, it's quite common to have uh, foreign bus companies taking tourists between Norwegian destinations. 
That's what. Then we we go on with 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 rail transport. Um, the reasons for for or, or the the reasons for rail rail transport or the benefits, if you like, is to <coughs> to relieve road congestion. That's why you have a, had quite a lot of programs trying to transfer goods from from road to rail in uh, within Europe. I'll talk a bit about one of them later on. There is a discussion, as we remember from last lecture, about uh, the energy use of sea transport, but there is a common agreement, or uh, researchers and uh, are agree that rail transport is is favorable in terms of energy use because the resistance between the re wheels and the and the rails are uh, are much less than between tires and the, and the road surface, so it's less friction, it's more energy efficient. Uh, <coughs> there are problems with rail track capacity, even availability of, of the rail track as, as such in, in, in some areas, and uh, increased lead time variance as compared to road transport, because you have this terminal and, uh, and, uh, and the handling of cargo in the way uh, problem where you need to you need to move it through a terminal uh, let's say on a larger number of, of occasions so things can happen there so this is uh <coughs> in 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 no talking about norwegian conditions we have uh the objectives are the opposite of this, but the numbers show that there is cargo moving from rail to road, which is just the opposite of what is the, let's say, the, the government's objectives here, to transfer goods the other way from, from road to rail. Uh, uh, shortage of capacity, quite a lot of the rail lines here are uh, single track, means that uh, there are uh, at least at times limited capacity and since the capacity is not priced according to what I showed you uh, on the previous section you have not that efficient capacity allocation mechanisms avail available either passenger transport is normally giving priority over cargo and it's it's there are some good reasons for that, but um, perhaps some of the passenger uh, train departures could have given way for uh, for car cargo transport. It's very little dynamics in the pricing of uh, of rail transport services, so it may lead to a less efficient system. Apart from that, rail infrastructure is expensive, time consuming to build, and also the, the rail terminals are expensive pieces of infrastructure. And the capacity on the main rail terminal in, in Oslo is, is, uh, is under pressure. And there are uh, plans for expanding it, but uh, they are currently put on hold because of issues connected to uh, to money funding and uh, also some of the surroundings are not too happy for uh, for all the the noise that is caused by a by a terminal like this so it's there are actually some strong issues connected to uh, to the efficiency of the rail transport cargo transport network in, the, in this country. But given that it is uh, working properly, um, long haul, it's, it's, it's competitive on long haul. It can take a lot of, uh, of cargo. The, uh, the payload is quite, or the allowable load is quite high. 
and also the capacity is in, in, in some respects flexible. You can attach a larger number of, uh, of wagons and, uh, and uh, have, an, have a relatively flexible capacity structure. There are different types of, uh, of, uh, of wagons that can be employed to suit different, uh, different needs. And, um, and as I said, it's, it's, it's environmental friendly. Flexibility in the available capacity, but uh, inflexibility when it comes to the last mile, so to speak, the, the distance between the terminal and the, uh, and the end customer, and also from the supplier to the terminal, uh, there, are, um, there are issues connected to lead time and, uh, and breakage and things like that. But it's uh, on uh, longer haul, and as I said, uh, in other countries, I don't know too much about Latin America, Brazil, unfortunately, when it comes to rail services. But uh, I know a bit about uh, North America, where you have these big trains uh, going slowly across the continent with, uh, with uh, a lot of cargo. So containers <coughs> are moved, which allows for actually a nice system of intermodal transport. The trucks carry carrying containers, trains carrying containers, ships carrying containers. So, uh, so there are also um, systems in Europe which tries to, uh, to uh, have a seamless system of more long-haul container transport with, with, uh, with trains. Some other examples from from the world: <coughs> Korea, India, North America, and so on. This is uh, an example from uh, from from Europe, and this has been a project, a EU project, which tries to see whether you can establish a aligned rail transport system between the Black Sea and Rotterdam. You have some, there are some nice, uh, nice uh, possibilities in that system, if you think about it. Because <coughs> the Suez Canal is down here somewhere. So shipments coming from, uh, let's say, China, Korea, can be loaded onto trains here, instead of going all the way to Rotterdam by sea. Could perhaps, at least for some of the s smaller uh, container ships or medium-sized container ships, can take it this way instead, because Quite a lot of the cargo has its uh, destinations, particularly on this stretch. Germany is a big customer of uh, such uh, shipments. But the problem <coughs> is that when you are talking about such a transnational line like this, you have a lot of uh, regulations based on tradition. Some countries doesn't allow foreign rail operators to, to enter. This has been amended to a large extent by including, I think most of these countries now are members of the EU. And then you have uh, sort of removed some of the rather peculiar pec 
peculiar regulations that used to be in place. So it's easier now. But still, there are differences in technological standards, signal systems, information systems, uh, mindset of people, how they do things, differ from country to country. There are strong differences between Romania and Germany in the way things are actually done. Uh, business models and uh, things like that, that needs to be aligned if this is, is going to work. And if you, if you need, if you want to, you can, uh -huh. this was a bit strange. But I have given the, uh, uh, let's see here, perhaps it worked, yes. Here you get quite a lot of information about this project. If, you're, if you want to look into how this is, uh, is designed, and uh, there are, there's a menu here about infrastructure, market conditions, and so on, which you can look into if you are interested. This retract project. It's all about trying to align <coughs> and to coordinate a transport chain along this corridor and try to establish business models that can make it work. I'll come back to that. Uh, Here you have uh, <coughs> um, load carrying unit types that are uh, that are used to uh, to uh, for for rail transport along this uh, this corridor. You have you need to start if you are going to do something like this. Try to coordinate. Try to establish a, a better international transport chain like this, you need to start with what is actually the market along this line? How does it look like? You need some numbers. <coughs> I haven't put much numbers here, but there are numbers uh, available on fact actually on this, this website. But I've just put the type of cargo that is normally demanded from this market when it comes to, to, to rail transport. Unitized means containers. Non-unitized means pallets in most cases. Uh, <coughs> so we see there are different, different descriptions here. Um, swap bodies are used as an interface between uh, rail and, uh, and, uh, and road transport. Dry liquid bulk is a, is a specific uh, challenge. It's, uh, you may have seen rail wagons with uh, tanks, containers containing liquid, gas, compressed gas, for instance, or, or chemicals, and so on. So this is just to, to illustrate main market points and their char characteristics. It's no use trying to set up a business model han which handles containers if the potential for container transport is limited. So we need to take the market con conditions into consideration, of course. And this project has tried to work out different business models. And when I talk about business models here, it's, it's a model that are directed towards improving the market share for this system, trying to gain market shares. And there are, <coughs> there are different models here. It's a third party logistics providers as an intermediary between customers and train operators. It's a separate company that tries to coordinate flows 
And by doing that, you can exploit economies of scale and scope, utilize the capacity better by introducing more units, and using the system better by coordinating different flows with, for in with perhaps different types of cargo. That is the scope. So you have this, uh, you have a hub, which may be uh, terminals at the origin and the destination, and you have a separate uh, company taking care of the, the coordination. This is a quite common model. We have it also in, uh, in, uh, uh, in this country, where a third party logistics provider, like for instance, Schenker or Kinnagel takes care of this. And they use whatever <coughs> mode of transport that is, uh, that is uh, most feasible, be it uh, train or truck operations or sea transport operations. But the idea here is to have one or a, sev a limited number of companies being responsible for coordinating the flow because this system has much larger capacity than, uh, than um, a single truck. So coordinating uh, the flows is, is vital to make a system like this work. And this, this is a situation where you can have let's say, a set of smaller suppliers and smaller customers, if you have a system like this. But if you have then a, a big customer or a big player in this, you can, you can have a direct contact between that customer and the and the train operator. You don't need that intermediary company, third party logistics provider, to, to coordinate things because the customer is so big that it can take care of this uh, on its own, own behalf. And it can also act as an intermediary for other smaller customers in the area. This model has been, we tried to implement this in, in, in short sea shipping as well, where one big customer or player can take, uh, take uh, responsibility for the, for the ship operations, but at the same time they can, can invite smaller customers in the area, coordinate the flows and try to fill the capacity. It's all about, I would say, it's all about capacity utilization. Because that is what is the advantage here. Because if you can utilize the capacity to, to, uh, to a larger extent, the costs go down. Because you have this, this uh, economies of scale, the falling, the, the curve of um, these systems are characterized by this structure where the variable costs are low, investment costs are high and you have this. As you have seen before. So to expand volumes decreases the average costs. So it boils down to, to, to that in, uh, in essence. And you need to design the model according to the market needs here. And here you have a, a kind of a vertical integration between a third party logistics provider and they also are acting as an owner of the, of the train operating company. I mentioned Schenker. They are owned by Deutsche Bundesbahn, 
or I don't know exactly who owns who here, but there is a merge between the the train operating company and the and the third party logistics provider. The motivation for that is again to uh, twofold. One <coughs> is to to try to to take advantage of uh, of scale effects connected to administration and uh, and uh, everything. And the other one is of course to gain market power. So that kind of alliances between the third party logistics provider and the train operating company is a two-edged sword in a way. It can cause some nice cost advantages, but it could, could also cost, uh, entail market power, monopolization of the, of the transport activities. So if you manage to get a good business model working that can coordinate consolidate cargo, you could get a situation like this with a lower transport costs and the system becomes more attractive. You can manage to transfer cargo from road to rail this way because the costs are going down. But, and I know I know I have to do something that I know that you hate, but I need to do it. Sorry. Just to illustrate one point here. The same shift, cost reductions. Quantity is increased. So you see the nice things that happens when you are able to consolidate more goods to use the capacity more efficient. But then you get the merge between the train operator and the third party logistics company they suddenly become a monopolist. If you th can imagine that situation. And what will happen then in this market? If we take this demand curve as the point of departure, and you get a monopoly, because they are becomes in a very they, c they are then uh, in a very strong market position. They will charge at the point where this is the marginal revenue of uh, of. Uh, Or, or the marginal income, and this is the demand. The one, because it's the demand after this, uh, this, uh, these cost advantages has been taken uh, into account, and uh, because of the increased demand, because they have been able to consolidate the cargo better. But then they merge with the train operator, market becomes uh, monopolized, and then they will sell at the point, this is traditionally monopoly theory. You know that from a basic course in microeconomics. If this happens, they will sell where the marginal revenue curve intersects with the marginal cost curve and they will charge according to <coughs> the market's willingness to pay, which gives a much higher price than the price in a market with a fair amount of competition.
this is the price if the market had been perfectly competitive in a situation where you have diminishing or when you have increasing returns to scale as I have shown you here the operators need to charge average costs unless they go broke because they need to cover the capital costs and this works if you have some competition but you at the same time need to be able to charge a bit more than the marginal costs to be able to, to, to go break even. If you get the mon monopolization of this by such vertical alliances or uh, vertical integrations, you can easily cancel out the benefits of this because then this alliance will take advantage of their market position and charge prices higher than what we might call the social optimum here. You need to live with a certain difference between the, compet the, the competitive e equilibrium and the average cost pricing because you have one market imperfection here which is the um, the scale effects and in the increasing returns to scale but if you get a monopoly <coughs> here things are getting less favorable for the market because prices gets too high quantity becomes too, too, too little and you are left with still perhaps too much cargo on the, ro on the road Did you get the point here? First, the third party logistics provider consolidates goods and, by, uh, and increases demand or throughput in, uh, let's say, this rail network. Prices drops, nice. Quantity increases, also nice. Then <coughs> they merge with the train operating company gets their hand on the operator they may then say that no other companies than ourselves are going to make deals with this train operating company and if they are then in a strong market position the market may get monopolized and the prices increases again so I take a lot of assumptions here one <coughs> is that it is allowed for a train operating company and that 3PL company to merge. Secondly, I assume that they get so much market power that they are able to charge higher prices. And then to make it even more complicated, I can introduce a system like we saw on the last section where you have <coughs> the capacity constraint and you have a road transport system carrying cargo within a congested network where price in the low period is set like this but in the higher period the prices are much higher But and the demand cannot be, uh, and, the, and the volume cannot be higher than the capacity constraint in the road network. So if the road network capacity is constrained, that can actually impact on the rail transport network. So you can consider, let's say, you could consider a situation 
where this is the excess demand in in a congested time period on on road right so this is demand that is not served at least they have to wait a lot to 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 be able to to use the road network and that's why why prices are so important because if you give this signal to the freight operators that in a congested period or in a congested network you need to pay and that payment may then cause this segment of excess demand to be transferred to rail. And if you then have a good business model, perhaps more like more like um, sorry more like this one where you have a third party logistics company and you may have more than one taking care of this consolidation you can serve this excess demand in this network and if you do that demand for rail services increases and you get the price effect you could if you consider this as an additional effect into the rail transport market, you can move the demand curve here even more because of this excess demand here can then be served here and then the prices drops even further because you get this transfer. So it's a self-reinforcing let's say it could be a self-reinforcing advantage in a rail or for that sake sea transport system if you manage to transfer cargo like this because of the cost structure transport costs the prices that freighters have to pay goes down of course I un I until the capacity there is a capacity constraint here as well but as long as you have excess capacity this can this transfer can increase the competitive advantage of a scale efficient system like rail or sea transport and the pricing regime in other types of transport networks that competes like road transport if you introduce a road tax to take care of the capacity problems here. Transport costs go up here. This, cap this uh, excess demand can be transferred to this, increasing demand, lower prices, and so on. So there could be an interplay between two types of transport modes here, road transport, rail sea transport. Do you get the logic of this? And then the challenge then is to, to, to uh, transfer all these nice, uh, or not so nice perhaps, uh, graphs into num numbers and try to model this. And this is actually what, what has, there has been done some nice attempts to do that. Because if you have the amount of demand, you have the slope of the demand curves. This tells you something about elasticities. Because uh, you see easily here that if the slope is, um, is um, like, yeah, I, I, I think I, I, I will not mess with that now. But the slopes here will affect how prices affects quantities. If you have a less elastic demand, a higher price will have a stronger impact on quantities than if you have a 
steeper demand curve, less elastic demand. So we need to take that into, into the models as well. I think I will continue with this a little bit next time. Uh, because there is an alternative way of illustrating the interplay between road transport and rail and sea transport, which I will show you next time, and which also will be a part of the lecture notes. And then, and then, uh, I'll, I mean, air transport or air freight is not very complicated, uh, at least not in in my lecture. So. We'll spend not that much time, and then we'll have some time for the exam questions after that. So thank you for today.